Okay, so today we're just going to work a couple problems. Uh, one of them will be review of related rates. And one will be another optimization problem. So two nice problems. So the first one will be a related rates problem. And here's going to be the setup. Then the angle between the side of length 4 and the side of length 5 is called theta. And the side opposite that angle I'll call C. Okay? And what I know is that this angle theta is actually increasing. So I have a triangle, think about it like this, but it's actually getting bigger. Right? This angle in between the 4 and the 5 is getting wider. Okay, which means this, what's happening to this side C? It's increasing. It's increasing. Okay. So theta is growing. By pi over 90 radians per minute. I over 90. Two degrees. And my question is, how fast is C growing when theta equals pi over 3? So theta is growing pi over 90 radians per minute. It's growing very slowly. Okay. And then as theta grows, this side like C grows. And you can ask exactly when theta gets to be pi over 3 radians, exactly how fast at that point in time is C growing. OK. So we have to translate this into math, yeah? So how do I translate? This first statement. The, the theta over the t. T, right? Okay, t for time, right? Oh, so yeah. Since this is happening per minute, we like to use t for time. Yes. So okay, we'll say t d theta over dt is equal to to uh, by the volume. Exactly, right? So the rate of change of theta with respect to time is pi over 90 radians per minute. It's just a constant. Right? It's constantly growing. Okay. OK? Now this question is, how fast is C growing? So how do I translate that? Uh, DC over DT, right? The rate of change of C with respect to time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then when theta equals pi over 3. So the way I write, the way we denote that, we use a little vertical bar, and we write theta equals pi over 3. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. Okay, so we want dc dt, and we have d theta dt. So we're missing something, right? We want to use the chain rule. So we remember what you're looking for goes on top. What you have is on the bottom. OK. 
Okay. So that's what we need. Right? It's d c d theta. Okay. So I need what? I need an equation that relates c with theta. We could, we could use cosine or tan. This is a no. so uh, right triangle, so we have to use the law of cosine. That's right. This is not a right triangle. Yeah. So we have to use the law of cosines. Okay, so let's recall the law of cosines. If I have a triangle, well, it looks too much like a right triangle, doesn't it? It's really interesting. If you draw an arbitrary triangle, the chances of it being a right triangle are zero. And yet, if you draw a right triangle, or try to draw a triangle, the odds are very high that it will be. Okay. That's definitely, okay, that's not a right triangle. I hope not. All right. So let's write down A, B, C. And you have an angle theta, although sometimes in the textbooks that's usually written in gamma. Okay. And the law of cosines, well, it, it's somehow a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. Right? It says that c squared, well, if this, is, if this was the Pythagorean theorem, it would say c squared is a squared plus b squared. <coughs> okay. But this is not a right triangle. So you lose something. And what you lose is 2 times ab times the cosine of theta, the angle between A and B. And in the particular case, right, where theta is a right angle, then you have cosine of 90, which is zero. zero right? So this term goes away, and you're left with the Pythagorean theorem. So the law of cosines really generalizes the Pythagorean theorem. OK. So in our case, well, we have a triangle, and we know what A and B are. They're actually 4 and 5. So in our case, we get 4 squared plus 5 squared minus 2 times 4 times 5 times cosine of theta. And of course, OK, we can do some arithmetic. 16 and 25 is 41 minus 20 times 2 is 40, cosine of theta. OK, so I have now c squared equals 41 minus 40, cosine of theta. I now have an equation that relates the side length c to the angle theta. Okay, but what am I looking for? Let's go back. I'm looking for dc d theta. So I have to do what? Take a derivative, right? Of both sides with respect to theta. Okay, so let's see. I do this side with respect to theta. I do this side with respect to theta. Okay, let's see. On the left side, What's the derivative of c squared? 2c. 2c and dc over theta. All right, we have to use the chain rule. c is a function of theta, right? As theta changes, so does c. Okay, so they're not independent of each other. So 2c times the derivative of c. Okay, what about the other side? Well, this should be the easy side. Okay, the derivative of 41, boom, that's 0. Right. Minus 40 cosine of theta becomes theta minus 40. Uh, it's going to be positive sign. <coughs> 40. Uh -huh. We got it. Positive 40 sine theta. Sine theta, sine theta. right. Right? 
cosine theta becomes minus sine theta, and then you have minus 40. So minus 40 times minus sine theta is positive 40 sine theta. Okay, so 2c dc d theta equals 40 sine theta, and I want dc d theta, so I divide by 2c. So this implies that dc d theta equals 40 sine of theta over 2c. Of course, I can cancel slightly, and I get 20 sine of theta over c. Yeah? Why don't you, um, I don't know why, but um, d over d theta, why are we taking the as with respect to that? Well, remember what we're looking for. We're looking for dc d theta. Okay. So at some point, we're going to have to take a derivative with respect to theta. Okay. That's why we did. Okay. And of course, we know when we do that, we're going to, eventually we have to use the chain rule and we'll get a dc d theta out. So, it's a little foresight. Okay, so this tells us now that dc dt equals, well, 20 sine of theta over c. 20 sine of theta over c times d theta dt, which we know is already pi over 90. And of course, we can we immediately see we can do a little cancellation there, right? You can uh, kill the zeros, and you get 2 pi sine of theta over. 9c. Okay, so that's a general statement. We know now what the derivative of c with respect to time is. And now we just need to plug in the specific value. Right? We want to know what dc dt is when theta is pi over 3. Okay? Well, when we plug this in, okay, we're going to be able to plug in pi over 3 here, no problem. We still need to know what c is at that point. Okay, so we better come over here and work those out. So we want remember we want a dc dt when theta is pi over three, and we have dc dt in general equals what are we, two pi sine of theta over c. Oh, 19. Yeah. Okay, so again, we're going to be able to plug pi over 3 in here directly, no question. But we still need to know what c is. So, what is c, and we've used c as a function of theta, what is c when theta is pi over 3? Well, remember we have the law of cosine. In total is how to relate these. C squared is 41 minus 40 cosine of theta. So C is, well, the square root. It's got to be the positive square root, because C is a positive side length, of 41 minus 40 times the cosine of pi over 3. So this is coming from the law of cosine. Okay, and well, we can see here, let's see, what is cosine of pi over 3? Square root of 1 over 2. Yeah, square root of 1 over 2, so that's 1 half. Right? 41 minus 40 times a half, well, 40 times a half is 20, so this is 41 minus 20. It's 21. Okay, and, okay there's not much nice I can do. Okay, so this tells us that dc over dt at theta equals pi over 3 is going to be 2 pi times the sine of pi over 3, which is sine of pi over 3. Yeah, sine of pi over 3. Square root of 3. Get it on the hand, right? Yes. It's the, uh, yeah, see, because, let's see, there was a 0, 
pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, right? So root 3 over 2. Very nice. Okay, so we have root 3 over 2. And then over 9 times c, c is root 21. Okay, let's see. Well, we do one quick cancellation. The s and the s, or this is the s. The 2 and the 2 cancel. All right, and root 21 is, is root 3 times root 7. So I'm also going to be able to cancel a root 3. So I get pi over 9 root 7. Right, and then what's our units? What are our units going to be? Well, uh, I guess I didn't really give you length of these, so let me just call these centimeters. So this will be pi over nine root seven centimeters per minute. So these are, you know, these could be involved problems, for sure. Uh, and you may have to recall one of these things once in a while. Uh, but they're good to know anyway. All right, any questions? Are you happy, Shannon? Eric, are you happy? I'm happy to recall me. Should we try an optimization problem? Yes. Okay. Don't get too excited. <laughs> Supposed to be roughly a box, and the base is a square. So I have a, a box with a square base and some height. That's what I'm going to build, and there's no top on the box. Right? So it's an open top box. And so here's my my problem is uh, I have, let's say, uh, uh, square meters of material to make the box. My question is, what are the dimensions that will maximize the volume? numbers in just to make you feel better or worse, I'm not sure. Do you need more information? Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. I mean, I can, I, if you want, I can always add a backstory for the box. I, I do like those math problem backstories. It's good, you know, I like groups, uh, grew up on the, the streets of, you know, Van Nuys, California, and uh, <laughs> mother was a drug addict, father was a, a physicist. It's, yeah, there's all sorts of fun stuff you can know about this box, but yeah. okay. So, well, remember we're always trying to write down these two things, right? We want to maximize. That's the M. But we don't forget the C from MC Hammer, and we have a constraint. Okay, and with a constraint, right? You can't touch this. That's what you can't. You don't get to change it. So we're going to maximize the volume, 
which for obvious reasons we call V. And what is the volume of this box, given the lettering system I used? Oh, those S's are fives. You thought those were fives? Yeah. Wait. I'm not sure how to draw them to be less five-like. How the S? Those are S's. Yeah. I'm giving no numbers in here. So a general. Yes. Okay. So Lace suggests, well, if you have any rectangular parallel of height, uh, you can compute the volume by just multiplying the length of the side, the height, and the width, however you want to call them. Uh, so S times S times H, or S squared H. Okay, that's the volume. And what's the constraint? Well, the constraint is what you can't change. Okay. So the constraint here is that you only have a certain amount of material. That's your L. And you know that that L, we'll assume, of course, it makes no sense to use less than L, so you can use all of L. And L, all right, you use all that material to make the sides and the bottom of this box. Okay? So that is, you're talking about the surface area of this box. What's the surface area of this box? Well, let's see. You have how many sides to the box? One. Six. Two, three, four sides plus a top and bottom, but we don't have a top, right? It was an open box. Okay, it's an open box. So you have four of these rectangular sides, which have area SH. So we have four of those. Plus we have the base, and the base we know is a square with side length S. S. And so that's S squared. If I Lisp a little today, it's because I've been working on my, uh, was it Castilian uh, Spanish? You know, aferlo, that sort of thing. I think it just, I get lazy. Okay, so we're trying to maximize the volume, and we have this constraint. Can you say that one more time to get that constraint? Okay, so you're looking, the L is how much surface area you get in your box. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how much material you have. Okay, there are four sides to the box. Okay, plus the top and bottom, but it, like I said, there's no top in this case. Okay, the bottom is easy. Okay, the surface area of the bottom is a square, so it has area S squared. Mm -hmm. okay. Then each of these spaces is a rectangle, rectangle, and it has area S times H. Oh, okay. And since there's four of them, you have four SH. Okay. All right, now, if we're trying to maximize something or minimize, what's our, what's our strategy? Take a derivative and set it equal to zero, right? That's the strategy. You're looking for the critical numbers. Okay, the critical points are where, those are the only places where you're going to get the max and the mins. Right? That's for Mod's theorem. Okay, so we need to take a derivative of V with respect to, what do we take a derivative with respect to? <laughs> well, once, because of this constraint, once I tell you what S is, the constraint tells you what H is. Right? Just by solving for H. Similarly, if I tell you what H is, you can use the constraint to figure out what S is. Okay, so you can actually choose either one. You can view H as a function of S or S as a function of H, so it doesn't really matter. You just have to choose one and be consistent. You want S? Okay. Lace says S. So we'll take the derivative with respect to S, and that will be the same as the derivative with respect to S of S squared. And we're going to set this, of course, this is really equal to just dv ds. And we set this equal to zero. Okay, that's our strategy. Okay, so let's compute this derivative. What's the derivative of s squared h with respect to s? 2s. 
Well, I have to use product rule. Product rule. Okay, so first I'll take this derivative, and I get 2s times h plus, now I fix the s squared, and I take the derivative of h. With respect to s, it's just, h what is it? H, prime. h prime, or dh ds. Okay, well, it would be really nice if I knew what dh ds was. So if only I had some way of getting it. Well, I do have this nice constraint, right? This is another nice formula that has s's and h's. I could take the derivative of this. So let's do that. So let's see here. If I take the derivative of my constraint, what happens? Well, see, L is a fixed number. That's how much material you have. So the derivative will be zero. On the other hand, let's see. I do the derivative of 4SH. Then I have to use, again, the product rule. Okay, so I'll say do the derivative of 4S first. is 4 times H plus 4S times the derivative of H, which is dH dS plus the derivative of s squared. Okay, that's the easy part, 2s. Okay, so 0 equals 4h plus 4s dh ds plus 2s. And now I can solve for dh ds. So dh ds will equal, let's see here. I'm going to subtract a 4h and a 2s, and then divide by 4h. So minus 4h plus 2s over uh, 4s. Yeah. And I kill at least one 2 there. So. Uh, negative 2h plus s over 2s. Okay, so that's, that gives me my dh ds. Well, the derivative of L, remember, L is a constant. So the derivative was just zero. Okay, so that means that I can rewrite this as 2SH plus S squared times, well, let's see, there's a minus, and I don't want to forget that, so that'll make that into a minus S squared times 2h plus s over 2s. And well, one of these s's is going to cancel. So I can kill that 2 and I can kill that s. Okay, and then, well, maybe it would be nice to uh, simplify this into one fraction for later use. So what if I since this is going to be over a 2, uh, perhaps I'll put this over a 2 by making this into a 4. So now I have 4SH minus 2SH plus minus S squared. So 4SH minus 2SH is 2SH minus S squared. Just doing a little bit of algebra in there. Okay. So now let's see. That says that 0 equals 2SA minus S squared over 2. Okay, that's the max condition. Okay. So let's write that to be easier to see. 2SA minus S squared over 2. And then, of course, you can multiply both sides by 2. It's not going to hurt anything. And now I'll put an s squared on the other side. I get s squared equals 2sh. And I can divide by s. And I get s equals 2h. Yeah? 
um, how, how far it says hold the dot by so it says s squared a equals um, dx h plus s squared dh over dx what? And then how does that equal four s h over two? So the two s h, right? I can make it four s h over two just by multiplying top and bottom by two. Top makes it a four, bottom a two. Okay. Why would you do that? Because over here I had a fraction over two. All right, and I wanted to combine all right, these two things into one fraction. Okay. Right, whenever you have something like a minus b over two, right, this is undesirable. And so you write it as 2a over 2 minus b over 2 equals 2a minus b over 2. No. Same, the same game every time. Okay, so this tells us that we should make the length of the side of the base of this box twice the height of the box. So without, of course, without knowing exactly what L is, right, you can't go any further than this, but if I gave you a specific L, right, then what you would do is you could go in and replace S with 2H right, in this formula. Okay, so for instance, Let's say L is equal to 400 cubic centimeters. Then we maximize, we still have to check this by the way, that we're getting a maximum. We maximize the volume When, well, well, L is 400. And remember, we said 400 should equal 4SH plus S squared. Oh, yeah? yeah um, when you have 2SH minus S squared over 2, how does that 0 equal to still 2S? Like, how would you get rid of that 2? Multiply both sides by 2. Um, if something divided by 2 is 0, then the something is 0. Funny story. Uh, that another teacher tells me is a girl in the class uh, was very confused at the end of the, the semester. Uh, apparently everybody did so bad in the class that the teacher had to multiply everybody's grade by four just so that the grades would be reasonable. And she still got a zero and she didn't understand why. <laughs> My grade was multiplied by four, how could I still have zero? <laughs> All right, uh, 400 should equal 4 SH plus S squared, but in the maximal situation, S should be 2H. So I can replace all these S's by 2 H's. Okay, so you get 8H squared plus 4H squared, which is 12H squared. So then, uh, are you giving us this I equals 400? Yeah, I'm just adding this in there. In fact, just so that everything gets easier, let me, instead of making it 400, make it 1200. That way when we divide by 12, everything works out easy. Okay, so we'll divide by 12, and then you get 100 equals h squared, and so h equals 10, and s equals 20. Okay, so once you once I actually tell you what L is, then you can really use this to compute the right dimensions. Okay. Now, this word maximize here, I've assumed that, okay? We need to prove that still, that this is actually giving us the maximum. Okay. So how do we prove that? Second derivative. Take, take the second derivative. We use the second derivative test. Not as terribly useful when you're curve sketching, but very useful. Okay, 
so uh, where was our derivative? Here was our derivative, yeah? 2sh minus s squared over 2. So we need to take another derivative of that. So d squared b ds squared equals the derivative with respect to s of 2sh minus s squared over 2. Okay, now this looks bad, but if I pull this 2 out, I think it'll look better. Don't you? A half the derivative of 2sh minus s squared. Okay, this looks nicer. Let's see, this is a half. Okay, again, we have to do the product rule. All right, so the derivative of 2s is 2. The derivative of h is dh ds. Minus the derivative of s squared is 2s. Okay, so, well, one nice thing, this, this half is just going to come in and kill all these. Forget about those. And we know what dh ds is. Right? We have that down here. It was negative 2h plus s over 2s. So this equals h plus s times, okay, we have a negative, I'll make this into a negative, uh, 2h plus s over 2s. And then minus s. Okay? So let's see, this s will cancel with that s. And what do we get? Well, I have a fraction over 2. And as I said before, every time you get this fraction over 2, it's undesirable, so you just put everything else over 2. So I make this 2h over 2, I make this 2s over 2. And so now I get 2h minus 2h minus s minus 2s all over 2. And very nicely, the 2h's cancel. And so you're left with minus 3s over 2, or minus 3 halves. Okay, now since s is certainly a positive number, this number is negative. Okay. And the second derivative test says if you have a critical point and the second derivative is negative, then that critical point is a local maximum. Negative baby maximum, positive baby minimum. Okay. So this, this tells us we really have a max. So we really have a max. <laughs> okay, and that, that finishes off that point. So as usual, there's just a couple of ideas from calculus that kind of uh, shoo you in the right direction. But then most of it, you can see, is just algebra. Right? So the algebra, of course, you have to assume that you've practiced before and that you know it. Uh, and I can't do a whole lot other than give you you know, the occasional flick of my finger to, to help you out. But uh, you know, if you know the very few things from calculus that set up these problems, that's, that should be really good. So for our problem here, well, what's the, what's the answer? What are the dimensions? So in the specific case where we actually give you 1,200 square uh, centimeters, then the dimensions will be S20, H10. Right. Right, and your C should be centimeters. Uh, in the general case, where I don't tell you what L is, all I can tell you is that, well, whatever the dimensions are, the size should be twice the height. Okay. So, we, it, and, and so this is a general thing. If you are ever trying, given a fixed amount of material, to build a box with a square base right, and no top, then the correct answer should be to make the side length twice the height. The box. That's, that's always true. So if 
you're going into materials engineering, this is you know, probably a good thing to know. Okay. And if you want to vary this problem, most of these problems can be varied in very easy ways. Right? For instance, you want to work a completely different problem, but it'll have a, almost the exact same sort of solution path. Take this missing side and add it back in. Right? Say so you want to put the, the lid on the box. Or take the missing top and turn it into a missing side. Right? Take this box and, and lie it down on its side and now say, okay, I want my sides, but I want to have it open on one of those rectangular sides. Okay, it'll change your constraint. The vol maximizing the volume, right, that line won't change, but the constraint will change. Right? So if you change the constraint, of course you change the problem. Right? But the solution path will be very similar. So there's a lot of, it's very easy to take problems that I've given you and just tweak it a little bit and now you have a new problem to work on and to practice. Uh, and if you, of course, if you really need to have like specific dimensions, then just, well, whenever you have a constraint that just has L here, just give it a number and then now you can solve, the, solve it for real. You're going to give us this I'll probably give you this. What about maxima, maximize or minimize? I mean, I'll give you. I'll give you what's written here, and then you have to figure out. That, okay. I mean, of course, usually the, this word is kind of a tip-off, right? Okay. I know to write that. I know I can write constraint. Okay. Then I maximize the volume. Okay. That kind of tips that off. Okay. So now you need to figure out how to compute the volume, right, of some figure. If, it, I mean, if the final problem was a, a geometric thing like this, you'd have to figure out, okay, how, how do you find the volume, okay? And then, you know, this, you figure, okay, well, this is going to the volume, so this must be somehow related to the constraint. Good, okay, that goes there. And then, of course, we had to figure this out, right? We had to reason out that uh, that's what L has to equal. Uh, so, no, I won't explicitly write down the formulas you need to know, but it's not hard usually to read it from the problem and figure out what you're you're going for. Part of calculus is is learning how to read and translate into math. Right? You know, so you're looking. You know, somebody says I have an optimization problem. The first thing you should be thinking of is okay, you're trying to maximize or minimize, and what are your constraints? Right? Now, if Taking a class in calculus, those are not the questions that you think of. You just think, what's an optimization? Okay, but once you know, once you've taken calculus, now you know how to think about problems. Somebody has a problem in the real world. Oh, I'm trying to, you know, uh, design this new refrigerator, and I need to uh, make it have a you know, sub it's a sub zero fridge, and I need to uh, maximize the volume of this fridge, but I also have some constraints because of uh, the wiring that has to go in the back. And you try to do this, now you think, okay, this is an optimization problem. We're maximizing something. I need to know what the constraints are, and I know how to set it up. I need to find a derivative and set it equal to zero. All right, this is this is a useful skill. This is, this is how engineers think. Uh, it's also how I went to the eye doctor last night, and I was actually noticing how many different things in their office you could not have built without. And I asked the, the eye doctor, and she goes, oh yeah, I had to take three quarters of calculus, differential equations, linear algebra, three courses on optics, and they all used calculus. Optometry? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fermat did a lot of optics, too. His, uh, Fermat has a big theorem in optics, so all related to optimization. Oh, yeah. It's basically saying light will always take the fastest route, oh, yeah. and the shortest route somewhere, right? So, uh, nature basically solves calculus problems constantly. Okay, well, uh, tomorrow is presentation day, so please try to get here uh, on time. Uh, and I'm going to have them come in and set up a screen and a computer. And, uh, everybody who sent me your PowerPoint presentation, if you were going to do one, I can just stick it on my, my flash drive, I think, and shove it to the computer, and then it should be ready for you. That's so no need to bring it. What's that? No need to bring it. I don't.